Glory to God. Lord, you are good. You are awesome and you are wonderful. And there's none like you. And Father, as we come right now, before your word, we are listening for you. We want to hear your voice. We want you to direct our lives. We want you to have greater access to every aspect of our lives. And so, Father, we are hungry for your word because we are hungry for you and we desire more. We want your word to prevail in our lives. Teach us your ways. Instruct us. Open up our eyes that we might behold the wonderful truths, the wonderful things that are in your word. And grant us grace that we might walk in the light of your word in the name of Jesus. And Father, I'm asking right now that by the power of the Holy Ghost, that you would anoint my heart, my mouth, my lips, every part of my being. And, 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 and that it would not be me, but it would be Christ in me. In the name of Jesus, that he would increase, that I would decrease. And that as I hear, I would speak in Jesus' name. Thank you, Lord. Amen. Let's have a seat. Now, because we need to move on to some practical aspects as to some how-tos in regards to prayer and, and, and um, you know, what, what, I, what I call the five pillars, which are primarily, number one, the, the, the lordship of the Holy Spirit. That is the key, but then it, that's like the hub of the wheel. And then the things that are connected up to the Holy Spirit having lordship is, um, or, or the, the things that are connected up to the Holy Spirit having lordship are, number one, um, prayer and fasting. Number two, the ministry of the word. Number three, praise and worship. And then number four, bold, plain witness that comes out of the overflow of the life of God in you. Amen? Um, but because we want to move to, to, to practically how we do some of those things. Today, I'm going to just try to preach a summary so that we can get past this point. Thank God. Amen. And, and, and get to that next week. Amen. We don't, want to be, we don't want it to be March or April and we're still talking about these pillars and not doing it. All right. Glory to God. Having said that, everything is subject to the Holy Spirit. Hallelujah. He is Lord. Amen. Now, we've been talking about the fact that our singular pursuit must be the pursuit of God's manifest glory, God's manifest presence. That it is the, it, that the glory of God is the very essence of God's being, and when the glory is made manifest, it's evidence of his reality. Amen. And that we, as human beings, have been so designed by God that the only thing that can satisfy us is God himself and the glory of God. Amen? When we get born again, we, we come into that relationship. But as we have become children of God and we are now his temples and so on, um, we thank God for that. But having said that, the Bible says our full satisfaction comes, according to Psalms 17, verse 15, when we awake and find ourselves in his likeness and in that constant communion and fellowship and harmony with him. That must become such a reality. In other words, you know, you ate yesterday, we need food today. Amen? I mean, thank God you may have had a wonderful experience with God yesterday. We need another one today, and we need another one tomorrow, and we need another one next Sunday. Amen? Hallelujah. Amen. So, it's all about the glory of God. It is the will of God for this whole earth to be filled with the knowledge of the glory of the Lord as water cover the sea. Now, we've also found out that the key to this manifested glory, which also includes anointing and so on, because Jesus was raised up by the glory of the Father. The Bible says Jesus was raised up by the Spirit of God. The Bible says that same anointing abides within us equating the glory with the Spirit of God and with anointing. Well, whether we're talking about the glory of God or the anointing of God, the power of God, um, the manifest presence of God, or, 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 or whatever it might be, wh whatever it is, the key to it all is the Holy Spirit and the Lordship and His Lordship. The Bible says in 2 Corinthians chapter 3 and verse 8 that if the ministration or the dispensation 
of the old covenant that Moses walked under, right? If that dispensation had the glory that it had, how much more shall not this ministration that we are walking in, this ministration of the Holy Spirit, how much more shall not this ministration be accompanied with far more exceeding glory and splendor? Amen? So, um, so and this is where we are. So we find that the key, and since Jesus, since the Holy Spirit ministry is to bring glory, is to glorify Jesus, um, it, 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 my understanding is that as he has lordship, there is an open door to more of the manifested glory. The Bible puts it this way in 2 Corinthians chapter 3, verse 17, that where the spirit of the Lord is, there is liberty. Where he has lordship, there is liberty. Amen? Now, that ought not to be a surprise when you consider, for instance, that it says in Romans chapter 14 and verse 17, that the kingdom of God is not meat and drink, but the kingdom of God is righteousness. Righteousness, peace, and joy in the Holy Ghost. Amen? So the kingdom of God is in the Holy Ghost. Righteousness is in the Holy Ghost. Peace is in the Holy Ghost. Joy is in the Holy Ghost. Amen? So if the kingdom of God, which is within us, would be made manifest in power and in might, that's not going to happen apart from the Holy Ghost. And the Bible teaches us in Psalms 103 and verse 19 that the kingdom of God rule it over all. If we can have the kingdom of God in constant manifestation, guess what? Everything shall be added unto you. Amen? The Bible says the kingdom of God is so awesome, so valuable, that it's worthwhile for man to sell everything that he has and put all of his investment into the kingdom of God. Hallelujah. And that kingdom of God is in the Holy Ghost. Say, in the Holy Ghost. So the, the Holy Spirit must have preeminence. The Holy Spirit must have dominion. The Holy Spirit must be in charge. He must have lordship. But you see, whenever you talk of the word, whenever you hear the word Lord and you hear the word servant, it means there's the will of one submitted to another. If, if he is Lord, he is not Lord if you don't do what he says. He is not Lord if you don't surrender and yield and submit your will to him. Amen? Amen. So, and, um, so the, the master key is the, is the lordship of the Holy Spirit. But then also, too, the key for the Holy Spirit to have lordship is... Are, are a couple of things. It's the fear of the Lord. It's that deep reverence and honor for God. It is that consuming passion um, to please God and to do His will and to see things His way. It is, being, it is that zeal of the Lord consuming you. So that is a key. That is a master key. A master key in the same context is humility. What's humility? Humility is emptying oneself, is emptying yourself of yourself. Amen? The humility is getting rid of the I. Humility is being consumed with Christ, with the Christ life. You know, I, 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 I was, um, um, a, a few days ago I was thinking, and this thought, came, this phrase came to my mind, that his commandment, that his command, his word is my command. His word is my command. And doing his will is my meat. And the fear of the Lord is the air I breathe. You follow me? Where it's about, it, it is about doing his word. It's about doing his word. It is about, it is about doing his will. In other words, whenever you find out whatever the word of God says, that's what I do. Amen? And, and what strengthens you? What empowers you? The reason for your existence, what, the, your way of living is that your meat is to do the will of God. It's like your statement before God, as, 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 as Jesus said in Psalms 40, verse 6, 2 to verse 8. Sacrifice and offering, Father, that's not what you're looking for. Or else would I give it? But I offer myself as a living sacrifice. I come in the volume of the book according to that which is written. I have come to do thy will, O Lord. Amen? 
It's about the will of God. In other words, being, being a doer of his will. Where his word is your command and where the spirit of the fear of the Lord is what permeates your being. It's the very air that you breathe. It's the reason for everything that you do. Amen. And as we walk in those things, those are the keys. Humility, the fear of the Lord, which of course leads to holiness and so on. Those things are the key to the, to, to the Holy Spirit having lordship in your life. Amen? And because he doesn't take it, you have to give it to him. Blessed be the name of the Lord. And then now, they, they, and then now how we do those things is where the issue of prayer and fasting is concerned. Because you see, we've got certain hindrances. Let's put it that way. There are certain things that get in the way <laughs> of his lordship. Such as flesh, such as reasoning, intellect, what makes sense, what don't make sense, emotions, how you feel, pride, self-consciousness. Amen? Those things get in the way. Unbelief. And, and, and the fasting and the prayer and, and, and um, the fasting and the prayer and the, the ministry of the word and... and, 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 and and, and the ministry of the word and adoring the Lord, forgetting about yourself and worshiping him and being so filled up with the life of God that out of the overflow of that life, you can't just help. You can't help it but to tell somebody that Jesus is the way. When we begin to operate in those things, those things that are a hindrance will be diminished and overcome by the power of the Holy Ghost. Amen? All right. So that's kind of like a summary, but let me just, let me do some preaching now. Is that all right? <laughs> Amen. So let's turn to, oh, we are in Hebrews, right? Hebrews chapter 1. Hebrews chapter 1. I'm just going to pick up a few verses here and there. Thank God for the Holy Ghost. Verse 3. Talking about Jesus. Oh, Kashila Bondo. Let's start some from verse, verse 2. Verse 1. God who at sundry times. And in divers manners spake in time past unto the fathers by the prophets. But he had in these last days spoken unto us by his son, whom he had appointed heir of all things, and by whom also he made the world. Jesus, who being the brightness of his glory, the Amplified says, the sole expression of the glory of God, the light being the outraying or radiance of the divine. He is a perfect imprint and the very image of God's nature, upholding and maintaining and guiding and propelling the universe by his mighty word of power. When he had, when he had by offering himself, accomplished our trend, accomplished our cleansing of sins and, and, and riddance of guilt, he sat down at the right hand of the divine majesty of God. The divine majesty on high. After he had accomplished the cleansing of sins and the riddance of guilt. Think about that for a moment. He sat down. The mere fact that Jesus is seated means that he has succeeded in the cleansing of our sins, sins and getting rid of the guilt. To be justified is to be declared, is to be acquitted, is to be declared innocent, and to be declared free from guilt. Hallelujah. Jesus, the expressed image and the glory of God. Now it goes on to say, um, I'm done in verse 7. Ooh, okay, let's just read verse 4. Being made so much better than the angels, as he had by inheritance obtained a more excellent name than they. For unto which of the angels said he at any time, You are my son, this day have I begotten thee. And again, and again I will be to him a father. And he shall be to me a son. Why did he have to say again, he will be on, I will be unto him a father? Well, does that mean there was a point when he stopped being his father? Amen? Why was God Jesus' his father? What made God Jesus' his father? Not giving birth to him, Jesus always existed. <laughs> Isn't that right? Jesus is eternal also. But Jesus was the son of God before he came. Do you know that? 
Jesus was, 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 was the Son of God for all the eternity past, whatever that is. But Jesus was the Son of God, and Jesus had the Father's divine nature. But he says, again I will be to him a father. There's a point when, it, when that came to an end where Jesus no longer had the Father's divine nature. Because on the cross, the Bible says he became sin. Amen? And that like as the serpent was lifted up in the desert, even so must the Son of God be, be lifted up. And Jesus was lifted up as a serpent. Jesus had to take on the nature of fallen man. And guess where fallen man got his nature from? Amen? So there was a time when, when, when the father had to forsake him, and he says, my God, my God, why has thou forsaken me? That he had no longer, he was separated from the father for the first time ever. And he took on, and, and, he, had, and he took on the nature of the enemy. So, but when he was born again, having gone to hell and defeated the devil and everything else, and when God raised him from the dead, and what happened then? You see, when, when Jesus first came to this world, the Bible says uh, when he was walking the earth, you know, and walking the shores of Galilee, he was referred to as the first begotten. Amen? As the, oh, sorry, the only begotten son of God. But do you know that is not, that is not so anymore? He is no longer the only begotten. He is now the first begotten. Because you and I are the second and the third and the millionth. <laughs> are you with me? Amen. He is the firstborn out of them that sleep. Hallelujah. But he's no longer the only begotten. Because he became sin. And once he became sin, he had to be born again. And when he was born again, God says, again, I will be unto him a father. And again, he will be unto me a son. And when, verse 6, and when, and again, when he bring in the first begotten into the world, he said, and let all the angels of God worship him. I'm telling you, the devil would have loved to hear God say that. There would be nothing that would have thrilled the devil more than to hear God says, let all the angels worship Lucifer. But guess what? That didn't happen. Lucifer is going to spend eternity in the lake of fire. You know why? Because he exalted himself against the most high God. And the Bible says in Luke chapter 14 verse 11 that if you exalt it yourself, what will happen? All right? He that, he that, let me, let me read it. Luke, Luke um, 14 and verse 11. It says, For whosoever exalted himself shall be abased. And that's what the devil tried to do. Man, he has been totally abased. And he's going to be in the abyss. <laughs> he has been abased and he's going to be in the lowest part of the earth. He is going to be in the, the most despicable place in all of the universe, the lake of fire. Why? Because he exalted himself. And the Bible says, whosoever exalted himself shall be abased, and he that humbled himself shall be exalted. The devil was full of self. Jesus humbled himself. Jesus emptied himself. Turn with me to, to Philippians chapter 2. Glory to God. Philippians chapter 2. So God said, let all the angels of God worship him. Why did the Father do that? Can you imagine that God said, let all the angels worship. God is saying, God is saying that somebody else is to be worshipped other than himself. And the only one that is to be worshipped is God. Put that together for a moment. God is saying that someone else is to be worshipped and ascribe glory. God is saying someone else is to be worshipped. But yet God says, you shall have no other gods before me, and I'm the only one you should worship. Why is that? Because Jesus is God. Hallelujah. Amen. We must never forget that. Now, but, but, but how did this happen? This happened after he became sin, and he got born again. What happened? Philippians chapter 2, reading from verse 5. It says, let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus, who being in the form of God, 
thought it not robbery to be equal with God, and he made himself of no reputation. He was not concerned about his own reputation. He was not concerned about his own reputation. He was not concerned about his own repetition. Now later on we are going to find out that the Bible says that we are to imitate Christ, copy him, be like him. We will find out that the same way the Father sent him is the same way he has sent us. And you see Jesus had a commandment from the Father. And according to John chapter 6 verse 38, the commandment that Jesus had from the Father was to lay down his life. And the laying down of his life did not simply mean die on the cross. The laying down of his life meant laying down his own will. Amen? Not to do his own will. Not to speak his own words. Not to pursue his own desires. But to pursue the will of the Father. To speak only what the Father gave him to say. To be in total submission and obedience to the Father. So to hum for Jesus to humble himself meant for him to empty himself of himself. You see, the devil was full of himself. Jesus did the opposite. He emptied himself. Amen? And he became obedient. He made himself of no reputation. He took upon himself the form of a servant. And he, was, and he took upon himself the form of a servant. Say the form of a servant. Now again, when we are talking servant, we are talking will. Amen? <laughs> we are talking will. Submitting of one's will willingly. Amen? And Jesus did that. Jesus says that was his meat. That was his pleasure. Malachi chapter 1 verse 6 says, A son honored his father, and a servant his master. If then I be a father, where is my honor? And if I be a master, where is my fear? Where is my fear? In other words, then a key for a servant to walk in his servanthood or submission to his master is the fear and the reverence that he has for his master. Are you with me? Amen? Now you see this thing here of yielding to the Holy Spirit and his lordship is going to come down to the submission of your will. Amen? And if we're talking about the submission of one's will and being a, a servant by choice, choosing to yield your will to him, choosing to live a life, where it, it is no longer I that live. It is no longer I that live. Because I were crucified with Christ. And it's no longer I that live. But it is Christ that lived in me. And the life I now live, I live by the faith of the Son of God. But the reality of that lies in, the, in, in walking in the reality that it is no longer I that live. If it is no longer I that live, where is my will? Amen? And Jesus walked in that perfectly. And because he did, he humbled himself, God exalted him. Jesus says in John chapter 12 and verse 26, I believe it is, that he that serves me, him will my father honor. Amen? He that serves me, he that submits his will to me. He that submits his will to me that seeks not his own will, that speaks not his own words, that, chooses, that doesn't choose his own pleasures, which incidentally is the end of Psalms 58 when it talks about, uh, about, about, um, about fasting. It comes right down to that. I think it's around verse 13. Not your own pleasure, not your own will, not your own words. That is what fasting is to bring us to. And this is how Jesus lived. Amen? And it is to the degree that we live that way, to that degree, Christ rises up and he becomes the hope of excellence. Let this mind be in you. What kind of mind? This kind of mind. Arm yourself with this mind, Peter said, to live the rest of your life not for the will of men, nor for your own will. And I just added that because you, you, are, you are men. Not for the will of men, but for the will of God. Because he that ceases to operate from his own will, ceases to fulfill the desires, will not live for the lust of the flesh, but for the will of God. First Peter chapter 4, verse 1 to 3. Amen? Now this is the essence of Christianity. This is, the, this is Jehovah, M. Kadesh, the Lord God that sanctified thee. 
The Bible says this is the will of God, even your sanctification. 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, verse 1. Amen? Because what is faith without works? What is faith without the right corresponding action? What is faith if I am saying it's no longer I that live? And the life I live is the life of Christ. But, to, but the corresponding action to that verse is what? Not my will, but thy will be done. Isn't it? Amen? And without that, my faith is empty. And the Holy Spirit performs miracles, Galatians 3 verse 5, but he does it by the hearing of faith. In other words, when your faith, when he sees a faith that pleases God, he steps in and performs. Are you with me? So, Philippians, so it says then, wherefore God also highly, he, okay, being found in fashions of man, he humbled himself. Sorry, let me back up verse 7. He made himself of no reputation. Oh, I, I wish, I that word, no reputation. Oh, do you know how much our reputation affects us, affects our choices, affects our behavior, affects our thinking, affects our emotion? You know, the Bible says not to be affected by the faces of men in Jeremiah. And God says, if you are, I'm going to confound you before them. And I'm not trying to preach judgment. Or I'm just trying to, actually, I, I am preaching the word, which is the fear of the Lord. But the fear to operate in the fear of the Lord, the fear of the Lord makes you independent of the fear of men. Are you with me? Amen? If I be your master, where is my fear? Malachi 1 verse 6. In other words, it goes together with the issue of lordship. And we are talking about the fact that when the Holy Spirit is Lord, there's going to be liberty. I notice what I did. That means the boundaries are removed. They are moved back. You're beginning to have a larger place of habitation. Glory to God. Hallelujah. Amen. And he would be liberated to perform all things for us. Somebody said, but you're talking works. No, this is not works. This is faith with the right corresponding action. Amen? This is you and I acknowledging who we are in Christ and acting like it's so. This is you and I glorying in the cross and the Lord Jesus Christ by whom I've been crucified unto the world and the world unto me. And it's you and I, according to the Galatians, living by that law and that rule. Amen? When we look at the cross and we begin to worship him, which is part of what we're going to learn in some prayer stuff that we should be doing, that we will be doing on our own, privately and so on. But when we look at the cross, one of the things we will do as we look at the stripes in his back and appropriate our healing, and as we look at it as it is, when he sweats it word drops of blood, and we appropriate the fact that we've been delivered and we've been set free from stress and we've been set free from a will that is rebellious towards God. Amen? When we begin to look at those things on a daily basis in our prayer life and look at that cross and we begin to magnify and thank the Lord for those aspects of redemption, we will also look at that cross and see that I was crucified with him. And we will also recognize that like he is seated, like as he is seated at the right hand of the Father, indicating that indeed he's accomplished the cleansing of our sin. And indeed, because he's seated there, it means that we are free from guilt. Well, in the same way, because I'm seated with him, <laughs> can you imagine the becauses? Because I'm seated with him, I can operate in the authority of his name. And it's how I ought to operate. Because I'm seated with him, that devil is defeated. Because I'm seated with him, the old man is dead. So you see, it is not works. It is what James talked about. Right? Faith being made perfect or coming to a place of maturity by having the right corresponding action. Amen? Now, from a natural standpoint, this might seem very hard. But ultimately, you see, this is part of Jesus' high priest ministry to help us in our infirmity, to help us in this weakness, to help us in this unbelief, to help us with, because this is the temptation that you will continually be tempted with. And he is able to succor them that are tempted. Hebrews 2 verse 12. 
verse 18. Amen? Because he too was tempted at every point. He too at every point of the way was facing, do I do my will or do I do the Father's will? Do I do my own pleasure? Do I follow my emotions? I mean, when he was heading to the, in, in the Garden of Gethsemane, and the Bible says how he became so sorrowful, so grieved, and, and I mean, and he was in such agony. In agony, and he's heading to the cross. Man, with that kind of agony, you know what you would do? Facing the cross, knowing what was going to go on, knowing the separation from the Father, and dreading all of that. In the natural, that type of emotion will make you want to step back. But you know what Jesus did? He stepped forward. He stepped forward. His feelings didn't say that, but he stepped forward. And he said, shall I not drink the cup which my father has given me? He stepped forward. That was a good opportunity for him to go by his emotion, wasn't it? What about the time when he went into the temple and he saw what was happening in the temple? People were, I mean, people were going back and forth with merchandise, trying to make deals in the temple, selling, you know, overcharging people for sacrifices and, and all kinds, while the next bunch was gambling over there. And he went in there, and he, when he saw it, he felt the same way as he did when he's going to turn the temple over a day later. And the Bible says he walked around, and he observed everything. There was nothing that was hid from him. And he saw everything. And you know what he did? He opened out his mouth. He didn't say a word. Think about that. Think about the self-control. What do you think his emotions were saying? What do you think his pleasure would have been? <laughs> right? What do you think his will? Where do you think his will was at? But he looked at everything. And he walked out. And he didn't say a word. You know why? Because the father didn't give him anything to say. And he had no direction from the Father as to what to do. Amen? I mean, many of us, we would have jumped into action. <laughs> but he walked out, left, uh, went, to, went, went back to Bethany. And I believe that night, that must have been one of the nights, but he stayed up all night. And he was praying about that situation. His heart was grieved. And then he decided, well, how am I going to deal with this? What am I to do? And then he, got, and then he heard from the Father. And that stuff was on the inside of him. And then anyway, and I mean, he probably didn't eat that night too. Because the next day when he saw the fig tree, he was hungry. Isn't that right? But then on the way to Jerusalem, and at that time he had heard from the father. He knew what needed to be done. And he was heading for the temple. And the fig tree was in between there and the temple. <laughs> Amen. But anyway, what he did to the fig tree, the father had him say that. I don't want to get off on the fig tree. But so he cursed the fig tree. And he said to the fig tree what the father gave him to say. He still didn't speak his own words. And then he went into the temple with the anointing and the power of God on him. And the anointing and the power was there because of his absolute submission. And he went into the temple and he began to turn the tables upside down. Not only that, I mean, if you see the power that this man operated in, this man Jesus. That he forbid, he wouldn't even allow people to walk back and forth in the temple. Go, go read the account. He wouldn't even allow them. They were carrying all these vessels. Through the, no, I mean, I mean, folks are like frozen. And then after he did all of that, he, they sat down and he preached to them. Isn't that right? But what's the point? I, I kind of got off on the story. The story is so good, I got caught up in it. <laughs> Sorry about that. But here's the point. The point of it is, if there was an opportunity for him to act based on his own feelings, his own emotions, his own pleasure, his own desires, his own will, speak his own words. But he didn't. Why? Because he had emptied himself of himself. And he was obedient. The Bible says he became obedient. He became obedient unto death. Even the death of the cross. Now we think it means he become obedient to death, and even the worst kind of death there is on the cross. But man, he was obedient to death all the way through. All the way through, like Paul says, I die daily. On a daily basis, Jesus was saying no to his own will. Continually. He says, the Father loved me. And here's a couple of references. Um, um, 
John chapter 10, verse 17 and 18. John chapter 15, verse 10. He says, I lay down my life, and that pleases the Father. The Father loves me. The Father is pleased because I lay down my life. And we think, uh, at least I have thought, that that simply was talking about the cross. But every step along the way, he was laying down his life. And he said, this commandment I've received of the Father. What commandment? John 6, 38, that I didn't come down from heaven to do my own will, but to do the will of the Father. What commandment did he had? You go down there, son, and you're going to do my will, not your own. And he walked in that perfectly. And every temptation that came along, whether it be the temptation in the, in, in, in the Garden of Gethsemane, whether it be the temptation in the temple, or whether it be the temptations in the wilderness, Constantly, he was saying no to his own will and yes to the will of the Father. Yo, Lord, no to his own words and yes to the words of the Father and that and that only. Amen? Now, he is our example. And Jesus says, the same way I lay down my life. No greater love has any man than this, but that he would learn to lay down his life. And he says, if you would do that, and if you, he says, if you lay down your life and not be living for your own will, but for the will of the Father... Them it is, they're the ones that love me. And if you love me, you're not going to be doing your own will, you're going to be doing my will. And when you do, guess what? Me and the Father, we're going to come and make it obvious that we are there. We're going to manifest ourselves. Amen? But Jesus, how are you going to manifest yourself to us and not to the world? Because you are doing my will. And because of you submitting my, yourself to my will, and it's no longer you that live, but it's I that live it in you, I'll show up. I'll manifest myself, and the Father will manifest himself also. Amen? And the Holy Spirit will help you to come to that place, because this is the weakness you have to deal with, and he will help you with those weaknesses. And I too will help you, Jesus said, because I will be there at the Father's right hand. I myself have been tempted in every point. I had to deal with this same submission of will continually, and I learned obedience by the things which I suffered. And that suffering was a saying no to self. That suffering was the emptying of oneself. And he says, I've lived that way. I lived that way perfectly. I lived that way so perfectly that I became qualified to be the captain of your salvation. To be the captain. I became totally qualified to be your high priest. Having been made perfect through suffering. So that now as your high priest, I am able to help you when you got to say no to your will. Just don't be like the children of Israel. Where they left, they came out of Egypt and they were doing okay. They were walking by faith. They heard the voice, they were obeying the voice. But then they got to the point when they heard his voice and they began to disobey. They did no longer submit it to the will. And unbelief rose up. So he says, today if you hear my voice, don't be like the children of Israel. Today if you hear my voice, don't harden your heart. Today if you hear my voice, yield to that voice. They harden their heart. Make sure that there is no evil heart of unbelief within you. And remember, I am your high priest. And I understand what it takes. I know what it takes to bring you into this rest, this place of faith, this place of freedom from unbelief, this place where, where pride don't dominate you, this place where self don't dominate you, this place where unbelief is not going to reign, this place of humility, this place where you can cease from your own works, where it's no longer you but it is me. I know how to get you into that place. You are to labor in the world to get into that place. And I, as your high priest, am seated at, your right, at the right hand of the Father, totally qualified to be able to help you and to help you in and through your unbelief so you can come with all of your unbelief, with all of the hardship, with all of the difficulty. You can come boldly to my throne because I know, because I sympathize. You do not have a high priest that cannot be touched by the feelings of your infirmity. You do not have a high priest that don't understand your weaknesses, that don't understand what it is that our unbelief is doing to you. But I am able to help you. So come boldly, and I am going to be able to help you in the time of need and give you all the grace that you need. I'm going to help you through your unbelief. That is my office as a high priest. 
But for me to be able to fulfill my office, you are going to have to hold fast to the confidence of your faith. You are going to have to hold fast to your confession. You are going to have to keep confessing even when your brain is saying you don't believe it. You are going to have to hold fast. You are going to have to keep declaring that I'm crucified with him. You're going to have to keep declaring whatever of my word says. Because as you keep on doing that, then you give me something to work with. And then I, as your high priest, can minister that to you and make it come to pass and break that yoke of unbelief off of you. Are you with me? So he was tempted in every point. But anyway, going back to Philippians. So wherefore, God, he was obedient even to the death of the cross. Glory to God. Whoo, what a savior. What a savior. Think about what he did. Think about the depths of submission and consecration. Let me show you another verse of scripture just for a moment. <laughs> Hold here, flip over to me to Psalms chapter 40. Psalms 40. Glory to God. And you see, this is, he's calling us into this. But he's going to help us. Amen. So don't be afraid of it. He says, learn of me. My yoke is easy. My burden is light. Amen. Psalms 40, verse 6. Sacrifice and offering thou didst not desire. Mine ear hast thou opened. Burnt offering and sin offering you have not required. Then said I, lo, I come in the volume of the book it is written of me. I delight to do thy will. Oh my God, yea, thy law is within my heart. Let me pause and say this for a moment. Jesus, the Bible says in, 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 in Isaiah chapter 33 and verse 6, the essence of it when it says that, that, that the fear of the Lord is his treasure. And it was talking about the spirit of wisdom and the spirit of wisdom and knowledge that shall be the stability of our times. And the fear of the Lord is his treasure. In other words, Jesus had the wisdom of God. He had the spirit of counsel. He had all of this. But here, if you could ask him, Jesus, out of all of it, the spirit of wisdom, the spirit of understanding, the spirit of counsel, the spirit of might, the spirit of power, anointing, and all of this, which one do you treasure the most? He would have told you the fear of the Lord. Amen? The fear of the Lord. And that fear of the Lord is what caused him to walk and to live that servant lifestyle. Anyway, so it says here, sacrifice and offering you did not desire. Mine ear have you opened. Mine ear, verse 6, mine ear have you opened. My ear have you opened. And then I delight to do that. But my ear have you opened. Say, say my ear have you opened. Turn with me to Isaiah chapter 50. Glory to God. Isaiah chapter 50. Reading from verse 4. If you dare say amen. amen. Isaiah chapter 50 verse 4. The Lord God had given me the tongue of the learned. That I should know how to speak a word in season to him that is weary. He wakeneth morning by morning. He wakeneth my ear. To hear as the learn. To hear as the learn. That is what it's all about. It's about hearing. It's about hearing. Knowing you've heard from God. He waked in my ear to hear as I learn. The Lord had opened mine ear. And I was not rebellious. <laughs> Neither turned away back. I give my back to the smatters and my cheeks to them that pluck off the hair. And you know, remember when Jesus would, when, when Jesus would, would, would say something, um, I think it was in Pilate's hall, and, and um, um, Jesus says something, and then um, and, and one of the men, one of those big soldiers, would reach across and slap him and punch him in the face and stuff like that. Think about it. And pull out his beard and all that kind of stuff. Man, can you imagine what his natural reaction would have been? But he says, I gave my back to the smiters and my cheeks to them that plucked off the hair. I hid not my face from shame and spitting. Amen? You get this? 
So when we talk about the suffering of Christ, it's not just on the cross. It is that submission. And when the Bible says that, that if you want to, when the Bible says, for instance, in Romans chapter 8 and verse 17, concerning you and I, glory to God, Romans chapter 8 and verse um, 17, where it says, and if children, then heirs, heirs of God, joint heirs with Christ, if so be that we suffer with him, that we may, may, that we may be also glorified together. You want to operate in that glory? Suffer. What suffering? Sickness and disease? No. Will. Your will. Submitting your will. You want to walk in that glory? That's the key. He says, but he says in verse 18, I reckon that the suffering of this present time are not worthy to be compared with the glory. Amen? Look at them, um, 1 Peter chapter 2. Hallelujah. 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 21. Peter said, and uh, uh, let me preface this by saying this. Um, you know, the Bible says there are certain things we are called to. It says we are called to glory. Amen? We are called to be partakers of Christ, which is the anointing. We are called to the grace of God. What else does it say? About the hope of his calling. The anointing, the power, the grace. Um, some, 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 some wonderful things that we are called to. But in all of the things that we are called to, and there's about five or six of them, called to holiness. And in uh, and about five or six things that you are called to, the major key to all of those things that we are called to is this scripture. Verse 23. 1 Peter 2, 23. Come on, where's my eyes falling? Verse, verse 21, I'm sorry. For even hereunto were ye called, because Christ also suffered for us, leaving us an example that we should follow his steps. The key to, be, to walking in the glory, the key to walking in the holiness, the key to walking in the grace, the key to walking in the anointing, the key to walking in the power of God is partaking. Uh, in other words, you want, to, you want that? You're also called to the suffering. Which means what? You're also called to surrender your will to the will of God. Can you see that? Amen? All right. So, wherefore, going back to Philippians, God had also highly exalted him and given him a name which is above every name. Because the rule is, you humble yourself, I exalt you. You exalt yourself, you are abased. Well, Jesus emptied himself of himself. He was exalted. The devil filled himself up with himself and he was abased. Now, choose ye this day. You can choose life or you can choose death. But to choose life, you got to choose to empty yourself. Jesus says you want to get a hold of this higher life? Let, low, let go of the lower life. Take up your cross and follow me. That's what it's talking about. Take up your cross daily. Paul says, I count not my life dear unto myself that I might finish my course with joy. And the ministry which the Lord has given me. Acts chapter 20 verse 24. Paul says I die daily. Paul says, 2 Corinthians 4, verse 10, he says, I continually bear about or carry about in my own body the dying of the Lord Jesus Christ, that the life also of Christ might be made manifest. Amen? In other words, you know, we talk about levels of operation. You can operate on the level of feelings. You can operate on the level of emotions. You can operate on the level of intellect. Or you could come up higher and you could operate in the realm of faith. Right? Where you don't have to see it to believe it. Or you can come where faith is your evidence. You could come up even higher and you could operate on the, operate on the level of love. Because faith working by love. You could come up even higher and you could operate on the level of being led by the spirit of God. And operating according to the truth. According to absolute reality. Or you could come up even higher still and operate in the life of God. Amen? Where you're carried about by the life of God. Well, Paul said, look, that's the level I operate in. And I'll tell you how I do that. 2 Corinthians 4 verse 10. He says, I bear about in my body the dying of the Lord Jesus Christ so that the life also of Christ might be made manifest. Paul says, this is how I do it. I have reckoned myself that indeed the old man was crucified with Christ. 
Paul says, I'm not just making that as a confession. This is the fact. I have been crucified with Christ, and it's no longer I that live. And the life I now live, I live it's the life of Christ. And I live it by the faith of the Son of God. Paul says, this is how I live this way. Amen? Because this is, this is, this, because I totally, completely identify with him. And because of that, Christ is big on the inside of me. And that's my hope of glory. Peter, on the other hand, had to struggle a little bit more. Peter came to, came to, came to in the book of Galatians, we don't have time, but read it from, from our word verse 10 right through to verse 21. And Peter came, and he was there with the Gentiles, eating with them, and everything was fine, and he was operating cool. But then what happened? Some other folks came down from Jerusalem, and when he saw them, he pulled back from the Gentiles. And he began to act funny. He began to, he pulled back, and those with him were affected. They were doing the same. Even Barnabas was going to join into their hypocrisy. And Paul spoke up and said, wait a minute. This is not okay, Peter. And he rebuked him publicly in that, Peter, you being a Jew, here eating with these Gentiles, and so on and so forth, etc., etc. Peter, you're operating in hypocrisy. Amen? And then, and then, and then, and it is that statement, and then he says, more or less, Peter, you are not walking upright and correctly in the gospel. What is the gospel? The old man is dead. You now have the God's life, the life of Christ as your own life. Peter, you're not walking uprightly in it. And then he went on from that statement in, in Galatians 2 verse 14 to verse 20. And more or less said, but as for me, I'm crucified with him. And it's no longer I that live, but it's Christ that liveth in me. In other words, Peter, your behavior is because you're not recognizing that that old man is dead. Think about that. And you will see how many times our behavior and our conduct is because we are giving life to that old man rather than recognizing it's no longer I. It's no longer I. It's no longer I. It is the life of Christ. And it agreed that the more we walk in that, the more Christ becomes the hope of glory. Colossians chapter 3 says, set your affections on the things which are above. Amen. So that when Christ who is your life shall appear, then shall you also appear with him in glory. Peter eventually got a hold of that, and Peter says, hey, look, hey, the, the key is, you are also called to suffer. Peter says, the key is, First Peter 4, verse 1 to 3, he said, look here, you better arm yourself with this mind. You're going to need it to live the rest of your life, not for the will of men, but for the will of God. Arm yourself with this mind of Christ. Peter got a hold of it. Are you with me? Are we going to get a hold of it? We are getting a hold of it, aren't we? Amen? But this is the gospel. And this is where the manifestation of the glory is. Amen? Let me go back to Hebrews and begin to tie this up. Hebrews chapter um, 1. I'm so glad I gave you a, sum a summary right in the beginning. <laughs> so, so God says in verse 6, and this is where we got off. Let all the angels of God worship him. Hallelujah. Oh, I'm telling you that, that when the devil hears that, he must really squirm. Because <laughs> he wanted that. And of the angels, he said, who make it his angels, spirits, and his ministers a flame of fire. But unto the son, he said, your throne, O oh God. God called Jesus God. God the Father called Jesus God. Well, I'm telling you, if God called Jesus God, he must be God. Amen? And even if he wasn't, he would become God. <laughs> Well, he is God anyway. Hallelujah. Thy throne, O God, is forever and ever. A scepter of righteousness is a scepter of thy kingdom. Now watch this. You have loved, you have loved righteousness and hated iniquity. Therefore, God, even thy God, had anointed thee with the oil of gladness above thy fellows. In other words, God called him God. And because he loved righteousness and hated iniquity, you know what that translates to? That's the fear of the Lord. That's the fear of the Lord. Because of the fear of the Lord. Hebrews chapter 5 and verse 7 says, Who in the days of his flesh, when he had offered up prayers and supplication with strong crying and tears unto him that was able to save him from death, he was heard in that he feared. He wasn't heard because of the crying. 
He wasn't heard because of the tears. He wasn't heard because of the deep agony he was going through. He was heard because of his reverence for the father. And even though he was a son, he learned obedience. He learned obedience by what? The things which he suffered. Obedience. O B E D I E. N C E. O B E D I E. Say D I E. Say it again. N C E. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. Nine letters. The middle three letters is what? D I E. And what's the middle of D I E? What is it? I. Even though he was a son, yet learn he obedience. <laughs> learn, let, yet learn he obedience by the things which he suffered. In other words, the I needs to die. And that's the suffering. Amen? It's not sickness and disease. It's not all that stuff. It is that I. Verse 9, and being made perfect, he became the author. Ha! He became, because being made perfect, that was there where, where, where the protection, perfection was concerned, was connected. He became the author of eternal salvation unto all them that obey him. All right, I've got to finish this, so let me do so. So basically, um, so, there, so really then, if you, so, so this, the, the thing is then, so to get this Holy Spirit dominance, the kingdom of God dominance and all of that in our lives, it's going to take a submission. It's going to take giving the Holy Spirit lordship. And the issue of lordship is directly connected to us submitting our wills. But in order to do that, right, God has not left us without help. He says, hey, look, I'm going to give you this thing. It's called fasting and prayer. Fasting and prayer is going to cause that flesh to come under. Is going to cause the, 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 the realm of the sense, the realm of the spirit to become more real than what it looks like and what it feels like and so on. It is going to bring you to that place to buffet your body. Amen? And, and, and so your body could know that I'm in charge, not you. Amen? To let the rest of your soul know you are not in charge. You are not one in this ship. Amen? So fasting and prayer is going to bring us to that place. And what I'm, rather than try to teach these now, when we get to these individually, uh, next week we're going to go straight to prayer, then, then, then some of the things I would have liked to say, I'll probably say them then. But fasting and prayer is one. Our next one is the issue of, um, of, of praise and worship. And praise, if we have time, if you look at Psalm 69, verse 30 to 32, is part of prayer. Praise and worship and adoring the Lord Jesus Christ. And, then, and when you were talking about praise, you were talking with everything that is within you. With your whole heart. Every cell of your being. Abandoning yourself to God. Giving yourself to God in praise and worshiping. And in worship and adoring Him. And I'm not talking about a few here and a few there. I'm talking about the whole church. Of course, practicing doing that in your own private times as well. Amen? And then there's the ministry of the word. Letting the word have a free course in your life. Let your word do what it's supposed to do. Allow the word of God to have lordship. Give it the opportunity. Because you see, your part in coming into this place of rest and overcoming that unbelief, um, prayer, a prayer and fasting will help you with that unbelief. Jesus says this kind of unbelief comes out by prayer and fasting. Amen? Prayer and fasting will help you. Praise and worship when you're not conscious of yourself, but you're consumed with him will help you. And in, and in that place where the presence of God will come and, 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 and you will be like in a crucible and he will just kind of rub off on you and he will just kind of polish you and he will kind of take some things off of you. But the word of God is also, the Bible says, the, the Bible says in Hebrews chapter 4 and verse 9, verse 11, labor to enter into this place of rest. What place of rest? The place where unbelief is shut down. Labor, labor in what? The next verse tells you labor in what? The word of God is alive and powerful. And is able to penetrate to the dividing of the soul and spirits and the joints and marrow. And is a discerner of the thoughts and the intents of the heart. And there is nothing 
that is hid from it. And Amplify says, everything is defenseless before the word. In other words, that word has the ability to transform your soul. Amen? Psalms 19 says, the word of the Lord is, is true, and the, Lord, the word of the Lord is perfect. It's converting the soul. So Jesus says, so Hebrews 4 verse 11 and 12 is saying, labor in the word. Don't labor for the meat that perishes, Jesus said in John chapter 6, but labor in the word. Don't labor for riches. Labor in the word. Right? And that's laboring in wisdom. Labor in the word, and it can bring you to that place, and that word is so powerful, it can chop off that unbelief. And that's in verse 12. And then, of course, by then we get to verse, and then verse 14 says, hold fast. Hebrews 4 verse 14 says, stay with your confession. You might not have arrived yet. You might still be struggling, but stay with your confession. Jesus is able to help you. He has sympathy, and he's able to help you in your weaknesses. And he is the high priest. Right? And come boldly just as you are with all the struggles, and he will give you grace and help in the time of need. Are you with me? Right? And then what happened is, so as we walk in this area of prayer and fasting, as we walk in the area of praise and worship, as we walk in the area of letting the word, the ministry of the word, both from the pulpit and as you will operate in the word of God in your own private time and so on, when you do those things and he's helping with your unbelief, he's helping with your pride, he is helping with the self-centeredness, he is helping with the self-consciousness, he's helping with all of that stuff, and he's beginning to tear those things off of you, then guess what's happening? You are decreasing, Christ is increasing, the life of Christ is coming up, and the more you get filled up with the life of Christ, witnessing becomes the overflow. Where your life becomes a witness where you can just tell people plainly about the word of God. Plainly that Jesus is the answer. And situations happen every day where you can plainly give somebody the word. And you don't have to be eloquent. God does not say, I'm going to watch over those eloquent words and perform it. Amen? The Bible says your words don't have to be the enticing words of man's wisdom. You just tell them the word. And God says, I will watch over my word and I will perform it. You don't have to prove it to them. You don't have to convince them. Right? You just put the word out there, live the life, and let God. It is God. But salvation belongs unto God. You can't give the increase. It's only he can give the increase. But you can give the word. The Bible says in Psalm 68, and I believe verse 11, that the word was given. And great was the multitude of them that published it. Amen? We ought to be publishers of the word. I believe that as we go forth and as we begin to operate in this, I mean, your house itself is going to become a, 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 a lightning rod. Your house itself will become a boat that Jesus can use to be able to reach, to reach the fish in the sea. A boat from which he can operate. And I've, um, that's a word that came out in prophecy sometimes recently. And, and, I, and it spoke to me and I know what the Lord was talking about. And I'll talk to you about it later. Right? But I'm telling you, God wants you and he wants your life. Let me close by giving you a word of scripture that I got this morning. Proverbs chapter 21. Proverbs chapter 21, and I, you know, um, I was sleeping during the night, and you know, you're praying, and you're sleeping, and you're sleeping, and you're praying, and so on and so forth. And I heard this, and I, I, I woke up this morning, and I thought, I heard that scripture. And I, you know, it echoed a couple of times, and I thought, I got to go find it. So I grabbed my concordance, and I found it. All right? And then when I found it, I thought, Lord, what, what? I know you give me this word. But what is this word for? <laughs> you know, like, what do I do with this? And I believe this, and I, and I think it was just to declare it. And, I, and so I'm, and I do, I'll do part of what I believe you'd have me to do with it. And it's this word, Proverbs 21, verse 16. It says, the man that wandereth out of the way of understanding shall remain in the congregation of the dead. That's not a nice word from a natural standpoint. <laughs> you know what I mean? Right? You know what I mean? Like, I like to have a sweeter word than that, you know. But, well, what is this? The man that wandered out of the way of understanding, and in all you're getting at understanding, God's perspective, God's way of seeing things. The man that wanders out of that shall remain in the congregation of the dead. But the Bible says in 1 Timothy 3 and verse 15 that we are the church of the living God, the ground and the pillar of truth. We are the church of the God who is alive and living things. There's evidence of his life. The manifested glory. And we are the ground and the pillar of truth. This is the place where his ultimate reality is to be made known. 
And these things that we are talking about is to cause that to become a reality. These issues of, of fasting and prayer and your witness and the ministry of the word and, 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 and worship. The man that wandered out of the way of understanding will remain in the congregation of the dead. But you see Psalms 37 verse 23 says that when a man weighs, please the Lord. Right? That's, that's not an exact quote. Anyway, um, he will make his steps. Da, 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 da. Another one. Psalm, anyway, Psalms 27, or maybe it might be, um, verse 20. The steps of a good man are ordered of the Lord. That's right. The steps of a good man are ordered of the Lord, and he delighted in his way. He delighted in his way. Psalms 85 and verse 13. Righteousness shall go before him. Righteousness, that oneness with God, God's way of doing things, and shall set us in the way of his steps. In the way of his steps. Amen? As we get a hold of the instructions of righteousness, it's going to put us in his steps. And the man who forgets that is going to end up in a dead place. Amen? So God is restoring unto us some truths, some good pathways to walk in. Jeremiah 6 verse 16. Right? And here are those pathways and I'm just beginning to lay them out. And prayer and fasting is critical. It is absolutely critical. The power behind the gospel for the gospel to go forth is about prayer. And fasting, coupled with fasting. Amen? Hallelujah. And it is about praise and worship. And it is definitely about the ministry of the word. The ministry of the Holy Spirit can only take place through the ministry of the word and prayer. According to Acts 6 verse 4. Without that, we are kidding ourselves when they're talking about the Lordship of the Holy Spirit. You follow me? Amen? Now, this is not a rebuke. No, it's not. Rather, it is to stir up your holy hunger for these things. And to make up your mind that as instructions come, you're going to walk in them. Because both you and I, and as a church, we got to come up higher. We got to come up higher in this realm. So that we are a church of the living God. We are a church that is the house and the ground and the pillar of truth. Where we are a church that is a house of prayer. Where we are a house of perfected praise. Amen. Hallelujah. Where we are a house that is the very testimony of Jesus. Where the testimony of the Lord is forever constantly present and in manifestation. The manifested glory of God. And where the ministry of the word prevails. Amen. Not traditions of men. Not anything else. The word of the Lord. He says I'm going to build it. I'm going to build it my way. And the gates of hell will not prevail against it. Amen. And, through the, and as they were edified. And they walked in the fear of the Lord. And the comfort of the Holy Ghost. They were multiplied. Acts 9.31. It's coming to pass. Say it's coming to pass. It's happening. Just like the Lord has said. According to the word. It is written. Hallelujah. Let's stand. Praise you Jesus. Glory to God. Thank you Jesus. Hallelujah. Amen. Hallelujah. Glory to God. Say I'm ready. Say I am ready. Lord I'm ready. For whatever you've got. I'm ready for my part in the gospel. I am ready in the name of Jesus. I have on my gospel shoes of readiness. Thank you, Lord. By your grace, I'm going to do what you've called me to do. By your grace, I will walk in my priestly office with kingly authority in the name of Jesus. I'm going to be the bold witness that I was designed to be. Showing forth your praises. Thank you, Lord. It is happening. The word of the Lord prevails in my life. The word of the Lord dominates my life. Thank you, Father. I give you praise and glory. I give you praise and glory. I have been called called out to show forth your praises and I bless your name forevermore thank you Lord 
Hallelujah.